If you've ever thought of quilting your own projects but just don't know where to start, I have the perfect first steps for you. I've put together a PDF guide. I call it Three Steps Toward Freehand Freedom. These are the baby steps, but they can help you move past your overwhelm and show you that, yes, indeed, freehand quilting can be learned. So if you'd like to snag this PDF, there's a link in the show notes, or if you're an Instagram user, just message me three steps. That's the number three, S-T-E-P-S, and I'll send you that link. Let today be the day you get started. I'll make one quilt. I don't like something in that quilt. So I think, what if I change it in the next quilt? What if I change it in the third quilt? The great thing about that is the first quilt doesn't have to be perfect. You know, some people get bogged down by the perfection and you don't have to be perfect. Done is better than perfect sometimes. Welcome to Measure Twice, Cut Once, the podcast where we hear quilters and other crafter stories and draw encouragement and even life lessons from them. I'm your host, Susan Smith, coming to you from my quilting studio, Stitched by Susan. This is where my long arm, Lucy, and I spend lots of hours doing freehand, edge-to-edge quilting. If you're not a quilter and those terms mean nothing to you, it's basically doodling on the layers of a quilt top with a 50-pound pencil, with needle and thread attached, and at really high speed. My philosophy is there's nothing as warm and comforting as a handmade quilt, and my mission is to get as many out in the world as possible. So I quilt for people, and I teach others to find freedom and joy in quilting for themselves. There are so many quilt makers and just as many stories. Quilting has been a bridge between generations, it has soothed loneliness and chronic pain, and it's been a beautiful expression of art and creativity that spans countries and cultures. Joining me today to tell us her story is Timna Tarr. Today's Pins and Needles is brought to you by The Will and Dave Show. Hi, I'm the Will half of The Will and Dave Show, a short little podcast that myself and the eponymous Dave, like to record talking about the things that really matter to us, whether that's social, political, or pop culture. Usually we don't see eye to eye, but more often than not, we can find some common ground in there somewhere. And now, back to Pins and Needles, with a quick tip for all you sharp quilters out there. Last episode, I talked to you about having a small, pretty tissue box right beside your sewing machine to catch all your little thread snips and scraps. Here's what you can do with those when that box is full. You could, of course, throw it in the trash, but I don't recommend that. Instead, keep a larger trash can, and I have this beside my main sewing machine, and I line that trash can with a pillowcase, and I just pick them up at the secondhand store or ones that are old and faded from my home or wherever you can acquire them. So line a trash can with a pillowcase, And that's where my larger scraps go. I'm a long arm quilter, so I often have even batting and things like that fill it up. It must be 100% textiles. So when you filled your little tissue box, of course you can just rip open that box and empty it as well into this textile filled pillowcase. And when the pillowcase is nearing full, you know, maybe three quarters full, but not stuffed and crammed in there, lift the whole thing out of the trash can So a simple seam closing off the open end of it and give it a good shake to loosen things up. And then go and donate that lovely bed to a pet shelter. They will appreciate it so very much. You all know I love my coffee. And if you're interested in supporting this podcast, you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan, where for the price of one delicious coffee, you're able to make a one-time contribution this helps me keep batteries in stock for my microphone and enables me to keep bringing you these weekly episodes. Thanks so much for your support and maybe take a moment now to refill your cup as you settle back to enjoy today's interview. Timna comes from a long line of quilters but didn't begin quilting until after studying art history in college. She bought her first long arm in 2001 and began quilting clients' quilts shortly thereafter. Timna's own nationally award-winning quilts are in private and corporate collections. They've also been seen in numerous exhibits, magazines, and books, as well as on the Quilt Show and Quilting Arts TV. 
Timna is a designer for Studio E Fabrics and is an in-demand teacher and speaker. Stay tuned near the end of the interview for a special announcement about a new fabric line and a really special exhibit. Good morning, Timna. I'm so glad you were able to join me today. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I am greatly looking forward to this. I followed your work for quite a long time. And whenever I see your different designs, I always think exploration. Timna is an explorer. Is that a word that you use to define your work or how do you see it? So I like the word exploration. I never think of that. Um, I usually use the phrase, what if? So I start with something and I think like, what if I do this? What if I do that? So it is, a, I guess it's a form of work exploration, but exploration sounds a lot better. Well, maybe it sounds more formal and maybe like what if is something that every one of us as sewists and quilters can sort of plug into whatever we happen to be working on, right? What if, what if. So so what are some what ifs that you use in your work? Yeah, I usually work, um, yeah, I usually think about what if when I'm working in a series. So I'll make one quilt. I don't like something in that quilt. So I think what if I change it in the next quilt? What if I change it in the third quilt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um the great thing about that is that the first quilt doesn't have to be perfect. You know, I know that this is stands as it is, and then I can do something different in the next quilt. So it's freeing in the, some people get bogged down by the perfection and you don't have to be perfect. You can move, you know, done is better than perfect sometimes. Right. And there's more than one way to do a thing, right, too? And beauty Absolutely. is also in the eye of the beholder. So I think <laughs> if it pleases you. So we're recording on video, so I can see behind you that you have what looks like a good-sized design wall. Is that your preferred method of exploration or of what ifing, rather than, say, using software to design? Absolutely. I don't use software because I hate, I hate it. I have it. I try it. Um, I've also find that when I design a quilt from the beginning, you know, before I actually start touching the fabric, if I draw, draw it out, it's really flat. The, I need the hands-on, the tactile nature to make the quilt sparkle. You know, if I just plan it on paper, it's not, not interesting. So I have in my space, I have a pretty good big space. The design wall you see behind me is about eight feet square. And then I have one across where I can see that's eight by about 12 or 16 feet. So I have oh, a nice. lot of design wall space. Yeah. Excellent. So do you tend to work with solids, with prints, with scraps? I'm definitely a scrappy quilter. Um, and I work with solids sometimes, but mostly I like prints. I really like how prints give movement to pieces. Um, when you work with solids, if they're, if they're great, because I use a lot of color gradations. So if a gradation is not really perfect with solids, you see the abrupt change but with prints there's movement within the print the color movement so I'm able to make the color move across the print or across a quilt with the prints as right. you know helping me along and I can obviously that would make it much more difficult too if you were trying to design on software scraps don't lend themselves to that because you never have your scrappy bits you know in your software <laughs> yeah I never think about that but that's yeah. absolutely true because when I work I would rather use 40 different reds than three different reds. You know, like I want a really wide variety of, of text, visual texture to look at. You used the word sparkle earlier, and I think that's really descriptive. Mm -hmm. There's just a life, a vividness um, to, to scraps that have that mixture of colors that cannot be achieved in the same way. I mean, solids have their own beauty. I have nothing against them, and there's certainly no. places for them. But in your type of what if quilts? I can see the real beauty of the prints. Cool. Um, not sure whether to go back to where you started or kind of what you're doing now, but what I've been looking at recently is your Noble Menagerie, your the Barnyard Collection. So can you tell us a bit about that? They are so utterly unique. Sure. So I wanted to make a pictorial quilt. And so I made, uh, I figured out a technique that works for me. And what I do is I take a photo, blow it up to the finished size of the quilt, grid it off, and then do machine applique within each square. Um, and then I can sew the squares together. So I figured out this technique on a quilt and then I got obsessed with it and I was like, I gotta make another one. So I made um, a chicken quilt. And then after I made the chicken quilt, I was like, oh, I have this picture of a pig. I'm gonna make a pig quilt. And so after I made the pig, I, I made like a mental decision that I would do a full series. And I've never conceived a series from the beginning. 
um, like I did with this one. But I said, I'm going to make 12 barnyard animals. They're all the same size. They finish at about 38 inches square. And um, what I love about them is they show the, I call it the noble menagerie because the animals feel noble to me because I'm looking at them straight on at like their eye level to them and they kind of have a, a presence about them. So um, I'm, I was excited to see them come together as a full series. Did I read correctly that they are going to Houston this fall as a, as an exhibit? They are. They're going to be in their own special exhibit in Houston, which I'm excited about. And I just booked my plane ticket, so I'm going to go. I wasn't sure I was going to be able to go, but I am going to go so I can see them. And um, I conceived of them to hang all together, and I haven't actually seen them, all 12 of them hang together. I've seen six or seven together, um, but not all 12 of them. So I'm excited about that. What an and honor. They all, yeah, it's really exciting. So because I'm a novice to quilt shows, I guess, and I've certainly never been to Houston. Tell me what, like, what's involved in that. Are there a number of exhibitors there at the show? Or is it, like, I know there is a uh, kind of regular quilt show with all kinds of quilters involved. But then do you see these various exhibitors? Do you have anything that goes with it, like lectures or things like that? Yeah, so there's the, you know, contest quilts, you know, the kind of regular quilt show quilts. And then, I don't know, there's a lot of little special exhibits maybe 12 or 15, and um, they're of all different topics. Sometimes they're thematic in terms of like social social issues or uh, somebody's lifelong work or whatever. Um, so they hang together and then there are uh, like walkthroughs with the quilters sometimes who will talk about the exhibit or sometimes other people will talk about the exhibit if it's like a group of antique quilts or or whatever, what, however they can pull it together to, you know, enhance the, the exhibit itself. Right. So but another, you should go to Houston. I'm I, just I know I in. should. <laughs> and, you know, I honestly have not been in the quilting industry all that many years. I started long arming about six years ago, and that was really the very first that I had taken a class or been to a show. I grew up in northern Canada, and so there, we didn't have that stuff. So this is all new to me, and Houston is a place I haven't gotten yet. But I do want to go now that the pandemic is, you know making things Why, possible well, again for us now that it's going you, well yeah but <laughs> i recommend it in the future when you can get there because it's i will it's unbelievable <laughs> it's unbelievable it's like what you, you know you've heard the stories just like football fields worth of quilts yes yes so i'm curious like obviously your quilts are opening doors for you within the quilting industry have they have teaching, talking about them, showing them? Has that opened other doors for you in terms of travel or in internationally or any other doors I'm not thinking of? Yeah, absolutely. And I will tell you the first quilt that I entered into Houston, you know, in the judge category in, I don't know, 2011 or 2012, um, won an award there. And I didn't know at the time that that was a really big deal. And it turns out it was a really big deal. And that really opened a lot of doors for me, um, just in terms of people asking me to teach, which I'd never wanted to do, never thought I would do, um, and helping me to think about my work in a different way. Um, I was a long armor, you know, I started as a long armor and, uh, working on other people's quilts taught me a lot about quilting and then what to do and what not to do. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and then going to these big shows really taught me about the bigger world of quilting, like what people are doing that I can't even conceive of. So um, uh, that didn't answer your question, but yes, <laughs> but getting my quilts into shows and being seen by other people opened a lot of uh, different doors. So do you do a fair bit of traveling? I see that you have quite an extensive uh, lineup of um, lectures that are going on yet this year. Is that, do you do those virtually or do you physically travel and go to them? Currently they're all they're mostly virtual at this point, but, um, yeah, pre pandemic, I was traveling two or three times a month to go teach and, and do lectures. And, um, I love meeting new quilters. I love learning from them. That's the great thing about traveling. The bad thing is, you know, all the time that's involved. So doing these virtual works or lectures has been a really good way to still connect with quilters, but not have to lug all my stuff around all the time. <laughs> exactly. You did mention earlier that um, teaching is not a thing you had seen yourself doing. Do you find that is a part of it that you love or is that just something that you sort of take the good with the bad? 
Oh, no, I really do like it. Uh, I like it a lot. And like, are you not going to ask? I'm not going to teach you or teach somebody. I'm not going to teach fifth graders. Like, I know that's not my skill set. But for I love teaching adults who are there to learn something new. Right. So and, and they is, all come interested and in wanting to know, right, and absorb. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. I actually teach a weekly like quilting class for beginners. And that is one of my very favorite things to do because it becomes like a little community because uh, it's the same people week after week. And uh, that that is one of my favorite parts of my job. I love that. So that obviously must be local then? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I love the sense of community that's just in the quilting world at large. Um, maybe other people see it in their industries. I don't know, but this I'm has sure been a new do. experience for me. So I, I sure enjoy that. Okay. Let's talk about more of your things. We talked about the barnyard collection. Mm -hmm. uh, Maps is another one that you do that is so, so unique. I've never seen anything like it. Tell us about some of your map quilts and maybe where that idea started. Yeah. So that idea started because I saw a map, a, a you know, printed map of my neighborhood and it was just very, very graphic. And I thought oh, I can make this has to be a quilt. So I figured out how to do it. I didn't really know how to do it before that. Um, and then I became obsessed. I also really love history. So when I'm looking at these maps, I'm seeing the historical uh, documentation of a different area, which that's where I get really obsessed with, or that's what I get obsessed with. So I made a bunch of maps and I have to tell you, this is my favorite class to teach because everybody makes a map of a location that's important to them. And so there's always a really great story. Like, why are they want to make this map? Why, you know, this is their grandmother's house. This is where they went on their honeymoon, whatever the story is. There's I was going to ask, really what, what are a couple of the stories that you've heard? I can imagine childhood memories, but the, I bet you've seen some good ones. Yeah, lots of childhood memories. Um, and it's usually... Uh, the maps might not turn out to be literal, you know, like the printed map, but it's like, this is the alley that I walked down to go to school. And this is where the library was. And, you know, those kind of markers that you have in your brain that might not be exactly the same as on the page. And so pe I like how people in are able to, I'm pretty literal when I do the maps, but I like how other people are able to translate it into um, something that's abstract and, and less literal. That's fabulous. And of course, throughout all your work, I see color, 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 and you've already spoken about it. That's obviously a big deal to you. Are you trained in art? Is that something that you brought to the table? Or is this just something that you are passionate about and have dived into? Well, I have a degree in art history, so I don't have a studio art degree, but I did spend, you know, four years in college looking at art and slides and talking about learning how to talk about art. Um, so I do have that background. I think the color really is not natural. I'm not, that's not natural. I wasn't innate. I had to learn a lot about color. And I would say long arming for clients was the best training because you have to match thread all the time, like lay the thread out on the quilt. Does this dark gray look better or this light gray? And in doing that for, I was for 15 years, it was like a huge training in color, but it's also my favorite thing when I'm working. Cause even now when I make a quilt of my own, I spend a lot of time with the color and the piecing and the applique and I quilt it as fast as I can get it quilted. Cause I, that's not the part that's You just want to get back to, to playing anymore. with the fabric. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But that's encouraging to know because to me, I tend to be a pattern follower a little bit mm -hmm. and I'm just learning to branch out. So it's encouraging for you to say, that's not a natural thing. That's a learned skill. Cause that means that I too can learn it, right? We can all learn it and people get, it's hard. You know, it's not, and it's not like someone can say two plus two equals four. And I can say to you like red and green, red and blue makes purple, but that doesn't, it's not tangible. You just kind of have to play with it and, and practice. And it's so interpretive, you know, what one person loves, another may not. So, you know, again, that just comes of developing your personal sense of style. Right. And we see color differently. You know, what you see as blue, I might That's see as true. green. So That's true. It's very different. So, I mean, we've kind of covered this, but have you seen a growth and evolving development of your sense of style in quilts? Like, has your taste really changed since the early years? Or have you kind of been true to, you know, I love bright, saturated colors or something I, like I that? do love bright, saturated colors, and I still do. Nailed you, but, didn't uh, I? <laughs> yeah. But uh, I will say I used to... 
I love traditional quilts. Like that's where I always, that's, those are my roots and that's where I always go back to, what's what I always go back to. Um, I tend at this point not to make a lot of traditional quilts, even though I did a lot in the beginning. Um, now I've, I always find myself trying to, um, I'm always making a challenge for myself. I always want to like see if I can do the next thing. So once I, you know, I know I can piece quarter inch seam allowances and make a traditional block. Right. Now I'm like trying to do something different, mostly to keep myself entertained more than for any other reason. And so basically we've come full circle. We're right back to what if, exactly. what if I changed this color? What if I changed that shape or made it giant or whatever the right. case may Exa be? Yeah, exactly. And honestly, I see that quite a bit with modern quilting. I'm kind of attracted to modern style and negative space and things like that. But I'm seeing this real love of taking traditional elements and then, you know, really playing with the size or the negative space behind it or whatever. And that's just a, another way of what ifing. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, that's how you can make it your own. You know, if you're just copying another quilt, it's not necessarily your own quilt. You know, this is a way to expand your own creativity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well... Awesome. You've given me lots to think about. Now I'm dying to attend at least one or a dozen of your lectures. So okay. let's tell listeners where they can find you online and maybe what type of classes, lectures, trunk shows you're currently offering. Sure. So um, my website is timnatar.com, T-I-M-N-A-T-A-R-R. -R. And um, I have actually on my website, I have four on-demand classes, one on maps, one on the stitch mosaics, string quilts and circles. And so those are all classes you can just sign up for on my website and take, uh, you know, in your pajamas whenever you want to. Uh, as for trunk shows and lectures, I do a couple of um, trunk shows. One is called Flying Colors and it's basically my quilting journey, but I talk about color and design and how I make decisions along, my, along the way. And the other one is called um, Repeating Patterns Before and After. And it's uh, I come from quilters. So it's taking my family quilts and showing you how they've influenced my work today. So I like that. The basics. I like that a lot. I come from a line of quilters too. And I feel that behind me all the time when I, I don't know, when I'm making a quilt, somehow I feel the, it's not <laughs> so pressure, I'm encouraging but... you along a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. So, okay. My big question in this podcast then is, what has quilting taught you? What's the big thing you've learned from it? Is, it? is there an aha moment? Is there a season of life it's carried you through? What's the big takeaway for you? I don't know if this is the big takeaway, but it's something I've been thinking about recently is that, and it goes back to the perfection thing. Just make the quilt. No one cares if it's perfect. You know, just do what's making you happy. You don't have to finish if you start something. And I say this in all of my classes because I know my technique is can be sometimes fussy. And so I always just say, like, get what you need to out of the project. And then you can put it away. You can, you can give it to the goodwill. Give it to your quilt friends. You don't have to finish it. There's no rule that says everything you start, you have to finish. Just it goes back to the playing and exploring. Explore what you need to and get what you need out of it and then move on. Excellent. Excellent advice. And I'll try and take it. Okay. <laughs> so I have a line of fabric based on the Notable Menagerie series of quilts. And that is shipping to shops, I think, maybe next week. So any, you know, this, we're recording this in the middle of June. And so it should be in shops um, any day now. I'm waiting. I haven't seen it actually Printed. Fantastic. Well, I will be sure and put links to where folks can find you and mention that in the show notes as well so that people can see that there. But I'm curious for myself is because I know what the Noble Menagerie quilts look like. What type of fabric line is it? Like, is it a variety of prints that lend themselves toward doing that style of work? It is that. And so they're, uh, it's based on the, the animals. So they're printed as panels. They're printed as 10 ah. inch pieces and three inch panels. Or I guess they're not panels, but you know, little squares. And then there are coordinating prints so that if you're going to make a Noble Menagerie or you use these fabrics, you can mix and match them. Well, that makes perfect sense. Well, you've taken a lot of the um, wondering and the questions out of that for those who don't want to do it from the ground up as you right. have. 
So Right. And there's okay. also a map print in there. So you can see them the maps too. Well, fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. So I'll put all the details for that in the show notes. Thanks so much for being here this morning. This has been a real pleasure. And I encourage our listeners to go to Tim Natar's website. She's got a fantastic gallery of lots and lots of her work. You will be amazed and you'll be glad you went and viewed it. So thanks again for joining me. Oh, thanks so much for having me. And thank you for tuning into the show. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider taking a moment to leave a review on Apple Podcast or the podcast app of your choice. It really helps other listeners to find the show so they can hear these stories too. For information on the classes I offer or quilting services, please see my website, stitchedbysusan.com. If you're a long-arm quilter and looking for freehand tips, take advantage of the live and unscripted events hosted on my Facebook page and replayed on my YouTube channel, Stitched by Susan. And if pictures are your preference, check out my Pinterest galleries of edge-to-edge and custom quilting projects. These direct links can all be found in the show notes below. So, until next time... May your sorrows be patched and your joys be quilted. Bye.